Welcome to Mining the Media, providing nuggets of news and cutting-edge questions and answers, minus the political blather. Here are your hosts, G.K. Allen and Dave Jeffers. Welcome back, everybody, to Mining the Media. I'm Dave Jeffers, the co-host and producer. That's G.K. Allen, the creator of our show and the co-host. And we have invited an old friend from the past, not age-wise, but from the past of, of GKs on the right balance. You probably recognize him, Gover- Governor Mike Huckabee from um, Huckabee TV. He's been on Fox News. He's a best-selling author and a presidential candidate. Sir, thanks for carving out some time in your busy schedule for us. Well, it's my pleasure and uh, great to be back with you. You know, you were right when you said an old friend and uh, uh, it's it's quite true of the age perspective these days. <laughs> old is a pro. For all of us. Well, you know, it's amazing, Mike. You and I met years ago at a Republican conference outside of Tampa. Our connection was Rex Nelson. Yep. And uh, you were many times on my show, The Right Balance. I just want to thank you for that because uh, I've said for years, and Dave, back me up, when it comes to interviewing who was my favorite Democrat to interview and who was my favorite Republican. And though you're very different people as human beings, I loved interviewing Mayor Ed Todd of New York City because he was so New York. And I always loved interviewing you. One of my favorite things about you is the fact you actually have a sense of humor and very often a sense of humor can create a political point more effectively than just wham, bam, thank you, man. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think one of the things lacking in the current political environment is a sense of humor. Everyone takes themselves so seriously. And I just don't understand that because, frankly, our convictions matter and our uh, viewpoints matter. But in the great scheme of things, none of us are that important where we ought to uh, elevate ourselves to that level. But today, especially I see it on Twitter, people have no sense of humor. They have no humility. sense of humor. Or humility. No No humility. humility. Now, Mike, uh, recently uh, you did something very, very effectively on your site, and that was explaining profit, taxation, uh, what inflation means. Can you give us something of a uh, cliff notes as it relates to what inflation really does? And I say that because the people I meet at the supermarket, most of them don't fully understand why all of a sudden a cup of popcorn chicken went up a dollar in a week. Well, the basic reason is, is when you start having the government spend more money than it has and it starts borrowing, Mm -hmm. and then you have wages increase uh, because of a short labor supply, which has been fueled in large part by the Biden policy of paying people to not work. It has been a disaster. Well, that drives the cost of everything up. And then if you add to that increased taxes, and these are two big factors, if taxes go up and if regulations go up, then that's more cost to a business. The big fallacy, Greg, is that businesses, they don't pay taxes, they collect taxes and they pass it on in the cost to the consumer. So if it costs a dollar for the hamburger, but now they have to fulfill more regulations with the health department, more regulations with the city and federal government, and their taxes grow up, they just now charge a buck 40 for the hamburger. So when that happens, that's inflation. The cost goes up, but the value has stayed the same. And if the cost of something goes up and a person's wages don't go up, that's really hyperinflation. So what we're seeing now is gasoline. I was in California last week campaigning for the recall of Gavin Newsom. Gasoline there was $2 a gallon more than it is in Arkansas, $2 a gallon. Now that's inflation. But if you look at other things, whether it's the price of bacon or bread or milk or the price of lumber or copper, um, anything that you buy from a store, from a supplier, the fact that that cost is up, but your wages are not, is inflation, which essentially, as Stephen Moore, I think, aptly calls it, it's a tax on working people because that's really what inflation does. It's a, an insidious, un, um, really unwritten tax on the consumer. There's another direction I'd like to go in in the time we have with you, Mike. It, it disturbs me greatly as the grandfather of two fantastic granddaughters. 
there's a war on women. There's a war on girls. And um, it really bothers me with the transgender uh, athletes wanting to compete against my granddaughter who pay, plays tennis. Uh, if transgender people want to play in sports, fine. Have transgender league. But the fact of the matter is that we are through, I'll put it this way. I saw this a few seconds ago, Mike. The bright part, and that is the war on when it comes to abortions. That the pattern over the past few decades has been aborting girls, as yes. they did in China, trying to have a ratio male to female. Well, between suppressing women playing against women in sports and then this imbalance as it relates to abortion. I think the progressive people are very anti-female. Uh, I'm really surprised that the feminists of America are not the ones who are more on the forefront leading the charge against the, uh, the nonsense of this uh, rampant transgenderism. Uh, I'm the first to recognize that uh, there is such a thing as gender uh, dyspho uh, dysphobia. There are people who are confused, but that doesn't mean that a six-year-old can wake up one day who is a biological male with the Y chromosome and say, you know, I think I'm a girl because it doesn't work like that. You're still a biological boy. Uh, nothing will change that. Not even hormone therapy will change that. If you have a DNA test, it'll still show that you're a biological boy. Um, so I understand. And some people will go through surgical procedures. And I respect people who believe it so deeply that they go to that uh, degree because that shows real conviction on their part of wanting to uh, identify with the gender that they feel that they are. But this notion of I just wake up and identify with, even though I change nothing biologically or chemically about me, um, it really puts people in a very just crazy position. And I don't think uh, folks should even do anything other than just say, this is, this is crazy stuff. So what I'm hoping people will do is recognize that feminists of all people ought to be the ones leading the charge against it because it is destroying the idea of, uh, of women and girls. Uh, all the advances made by Title IX and sports are being erased by this, uh, by this notion. You know, um, talking about feminists, I follow a few sports writers from San Francisco Bay Area because I grew up in the North Bay Area. Ann Killian's one of the biggest sports writers for the San Francisco Chronicle, an avowed feminist. She just wrote today um, that opposing transgenders in sports is a form of sexism. And that's how nonsensical these arguments have become. It, it's just, it makes no sense. Well, it doesn't. And if, uh, if girls ever want to compete, uh, particularly in a lot of sports, let's say whether it's soccer or basketball or uh, track and field, throwing a shot put or uh, throwing the hammer. Um, they just don't have the same upper body strength that a male has. It's, that's not sexist. That's just biology. There are things women can do that men can't do. I can't give birth and I don't care how many new emojis come out, uh, you know, with, with uh, Google, I still can't give birth. I'm a male. And, and, Recently, there was one of the medical schools where a doctor on the faculty got in trouble because he talked about right. uh, pregnant women. Well, I hate to break it to those students who were upset by that, but that's the only gender which can be pregnant. It's women. Men can't be pregnant. This because women, we, we are strong, Mike, we are stronger muscle-wise, but they're stronger internally. Uh, you ask any doctor or nurse who's the patient in the hospital <laughs> with the courage, and nine yeah. times out of ten it's the woman, I would be afraid to give birth. I'd be whimpering. I'd be a fool. <laughs> I'd be saying, no, 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 get this over with. I mean, women really internally are much tougher. I'm still sucking my thumb from my knee replacement nine months ago. <laughs> <laughs> I totally understand. <laughs> Mike, I, I've got to ask you this, because you may remember I was a music critic for years and involved in the music business. And I see a whole bunch of beautiful uh, stringed instruments behind you. When did the collection start? I mean, I see some Fender, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, yeah. and uh, some nice acoustic guitars. You've got some very fine strings back there. Well, I've got quite a collection. I think there's, uh, I probably have over 50 guitars all total in my collection. Wow. And you might say I've been collecting since I started playing when I was 11. 
but it got more serious uh, the older I got. And uh, a lot of the guitars, quite frankly, have been gifts that people have given me through the years for various reasons. I played in an event. Uh, they gave me a guitar to commemorate it. Uh, sometimes uh, the guitars, for example, I was given one by Roy Orbison's widow, a beautiful 12 string acoustic guitar. The Gatlin brothers gave me a guitar. Wow. Uh, Leopard gave me a guitar. I have one from the Ventures. I've got one from um, signed by Ringo Starr, another signed by George Jones, the late great country singer. Nice. Uh, one given to me by Leonard Skinner, another by Alabama. So, you know, there's there's a lot of these guitars that have some great stories behind them. Well, I got to tell you, Governor, I got to be on Dr. Dobson's uh, show a couple of years ago. And in his his office, he has all of his um, honorary gowns hung up in these <laughs> huge uh, cases around the building. Yeah. This beats that by a mile. <laughs> you know what it says about you, Mike, too? When you listed those musicians, pretty wide range of mental Absolutely. Uh, approach to music you know there's there's a <laughs> mental component to creating music yes. evo is totally different from the rolling stones who are totally different from pink floyd who are totally different from sleep at the wheel and yet it's all wonderful stuff well and i'm a, a person who likes a lot of genres of music but i do say that i'm a little biased when it comes to classic music whether it's classic country classic rock classic blues a lot of the modern music that's uh, passing these days as pop music is really pop goes the weasel because it's uh, ear candy, mostly produced in a studio by engineers, not really unique to the artist. And nobody's going to be listening to it in 56 years. But we're still listening to the music of the 50s and 60s and 70s because it's timeless. And the first riff of a guitar that you hear on a song from the 60s or 70s, you say, that's the Stones, that's Led Zeppelin, that's Credence, because they have a signature style that is unique to them. And you don't see that or hear that in modern music today. And I, I just sometimes lament that that level of creativity and uniqueness has been totally lost for the sake of just a, a commercial ear candy uh, release of a song it's there, it's gone, nobody remembers it, and in a few years, nobody will be playing it or listening to it. Well, speaking of the Rolling Stones, according to a couple of music sources, Charlie Watts is not going to be the drummer for the final Rolling Stones tour. Apparently, he's recovering from an operation. Mm. Well, I'm not available, or I would uh, offer to sit <laughs> in. Uh, I certainly meet the age requirement, but uh, probably not the skill set. Well, but, you know, what a career. Look at that. I mean, these guys have been at it. And I'll, I've been to a Stones concert. And what amazes me is in their 70s, mm. they're not mailing it in. They yeah. go out there and give it 110 percent. You'd think that they were still trying to audition to be accepted. And that's why they've lasted. They have continued to make great music, continued to enjoy playing it and continue to play it at 100 percent of their capacity. Yeah, yeah. Um. I saw John Fogarty about five years ago, and he's just turned 70. He was amazing. But I'm watching Greg as you were talking, Governor, mm. and he looked like Jose Altuve in the 2017 World Series sitting on that fastball he knew was coming because you were right in his wheelhouse. I mean, he talks about this all the time. And Billy Joel probably put it best. He said, anything that can be reproduced by a computer is not music. So, Mike, feel free to use my phrase. I call it sonic structure. It's, an, it's not songwriting. It's an excuse for the lead singer to have something to blab, but it's sonic structure. If you look at Leonard, uh, at the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Kinks, Ray Davies, a very underrated yep. songwriter. Agreed. Uh, you listen to R.E.M., you listen to the Eagles, to the Birds, to Bob Dylan, to Gordon Lightfoot, any number of people. Chuck Berry. I was bothered by the fact, Mike, when Chuck Berry died, he didn't get his properties in national media because he was the first person to write pop songs that had social significance. Brown-eyed, handsome man, Maybelline and Memphis was about divorce. Who was writing about divorce? He was one of the great early rock and rollers because he wrote his own stuff. And I truly believe, and you, I know you'd like this because you're such a, a music buff and a fine musician. The fact is that I don't think Bob Dylan ever would have written Subterranean Homesick Blues if 
uh, Chuck Berry didn't write some of the songs that he wrote. You can hear Chuck Berry in the Rolling Stones big time with Keith Richards. With yeah. Bob Dylan electric, his early electric stuff with any number of people. And every, everybody knows Elvis. Everybody knows Jerry Lee Lewis. Fats Domino, one of the nicest people I ever interviewed or met or reviewed. But the fact of the matter is that I think Chuck Berry of the original rock and rollers is important because we both appreciate songwriting. And he wrote great songs, not sonic structure. Well said. Well said indeed. Well, God, if, you, if you had one, one final thing, hey, forgive me if I'm, I can't help it. I'm a music artist now. It's going to be all yours, Dave. Mike, here's a very obvious question because I want to avoid any more politics for the moment. If you had to take one album with you and you were stuck on a desert island for a year and you had to have one album to listen to, what would it be? Uh, Meet the Beatles. 1964. And the reason is, is was because it was a seminal work that affected my life more than any other uh, musical moment. Um, I was one of those kids that watched Ed Sullivan in February 64, saw the Beatles, decided I want to do that. I want to be able to play electric guitar. I want to be in a band. And so the first album I ever owned was Meet the Beatles. And I played it till the grooves wore out. So there have been many great albums that I've got and some still in vinyl in my collection, but that's the one that had the greatest influence and the one that I probably played more. And I played it on a little cheap record player. It wasn't even a stereo. It was just a record player uh, as loud as I could play it, which wasn't very loud with a two inch speaker, but uh, <laughs> it's, it was what it was. That's one of my favorite memories of a seven-year-old is my former Marine Corps father. We were watching Ed Sullivan live. We'd always leave my grandmother's home right after Ed Sullivan on Sunday night. He lost his mind. He <laughs> thought the communists had taken over. The, I mean, I, I teased him about that before he passed away. He didn't remember it, of course. He, he always denied everything that was funny about him. But I remember that, and it was. And then um, going to school the following year, um, my sister and all of her little sixth grade friends, they had those little record players, and they're listening to them. So that, that's a great call. Well, Governor, I know we're, um, we're coming up at the end of the interview, and I want to thank you for your time. I make sure, I'll be make sure to um, share your website because it's really good. It has – I am I recently started designing websites, and – Whoever's your web designer, I tip my hat to them because it's very well laid out, very simple to follow. Um, there's tons of stuff there. So when we have you sign off, I'll be sure to bring it up uh, so our readers, and I mean, our listeners and our viewers on YouTube and Rumble can see it because it is a source of wealth. And particularly that past monologue that um, GK talked about at the introduction is a must. I sent it to my son-in-law and said, hey, our, my grandson, his son, he's 12. I said, he'll get this. He'll yeah. totally Good. get this without much having to say I didn't understand anything. You did a brilliant job on that, and, and your website's fantastic. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure visiting with you, and I hope we get to do it again. We sure look forward to it, sir. Thank, thank you, you very much, much, Mike. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, God bless. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, that was beyond a special treat because um, I kind of had an idea it might go to music, but when I saw the guitars on the wall, I said, <laughs> yep. politics, maybe tiny bit. And then we're off and running. And when he was talking about, dude, I, I make sure you watch the video when he's describing what music's like. You had a Cheshire cat smile on your face. Like I said, you were looking like Jose Altuve knowing that fastball was coming <laughs> in the 2017 World Series, and I was like, "Oh man, he's going I'm gonna have to. We're gonna have to hold him back." But that that was wonderful. He's such. He's a human being, oh my and gosh. he has many interests. He's not a one-dimensional person. And if more conservatives were like Mike Huckabee, I think the world would be better off. And if more anybody had his variety of musical tastes, because he was talking about the Meet the Beatles and how important it was to him. Now, I'm older than you guys. My first album was uh, Have Twangy Guitar Will Travel by Dwayne Eddy. Mm -hmm. It's the album that had Rebel Round, which was his biggest instrumental hit. So I go back even farther than that. I, uh, Mike, uh, 
You know what, Greg? I think, I think when you say that, because I know a lot of conservatives, and when you get them, you know, when you have dinner with them, you have coffee with them, you learn about them that they have a lot of interests, but they're but so, they don't do it publicly. Right? They're, it's like they're embarrassed to be a human being. I've got to be this staunch uh, power suit, power tie wearing conservatives. And Look, it's real simple. I'm a conservative, but I love anarchy in the UK by the sex system. Right. <laughs> I'm serious. I know. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Barack Obama's worst nightmare. I cling to my guns and my Bible. And, and I'm, I believe, and I will suffer for it if I have to, that the Bible is the word of God. And that Jesus is the only way to heaven. But I love talking music and books and art. And, and I think it particularly, and I know you say this before, not just in the conservative circle, but in the even smaller circle of Christians, we have, we have given up art. And that's when we had Dr. Ted Bear. We need to bring him back. We've given up the entertainment business to the evil to, to, and it's like, where are all the great artists? Your grandson is studying to be in, in the film industry. We need more of that. We need more young men and women who are not just strong conservatives, but strong believers, strong Christians, strong people morally in there and put out good products. Because you know what? These movies kill at the box office. God's Not Dead by Pure Flix has three movies out. They've all been blockbusters. So the, 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 the hunger for good entertainment, whether it's art, um, whether it's good books, I mean, the Jerry Jenkins, Tim LaHaye Left Behind series, massive bestsellers. Just all, everything that, that we like, if we would write and produce entertainment with the, what you and I always talk about a lot on this show, People will, will, will jump all over it. The market's well, It's really there. quite simple. Part of the problem is now that, uh, and it's really odd, when you look at Hollywood films from the 30s and 40s, most of them, if they were political or social at all, loved America. They have been critical about something here and there. But basically, you got the feeling that the people putting the film together uh, like this country. Uh, I find it very odd and very disturbing that in contemporary Hollywood, uh, so many people put this country down. Well, take that attitude and try to make a film in China that criticizes the leader of China. See what happens to you. Have the Chinese Olympic runners or whoever, the people in the Olympics right now, Take me and say, my country's wrong about what they're doing to Muslims in the Western provinces. What's going to happen to you? Like the people in Hong Kong, you're going to disappear. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go ahead and um, close out this show. I want to show Mike's website to our viewers. So let me share my screen real quick so that um, people can just see how beautiful it is. And this is his website here. Um, it, he's his shows on the Trinity Broadcasting Network, Saturdays seven or eight Eastern, seven Central. Then it shows again on Sunday. But go to his website. It's Huckabee.tv. Huckabee.tv. He also has his other website, MikeHuckabee.com. But this right here, if Democrats got this, their heads might explode. That's the monologue that we were talking about. Um, about the economics that is so simply explained, but, um, but completely accurate. <laughs> accurate. It was simple. Yeah. It was accurate. But he's got such great stuff. And like, who again, kudos to his webmaster, because this is a wonderfully laid out, easy to follow website. Um, and all these videos, you can actually watch embedded there on the website. But be sure to go to his website. And let me see if I can stop sharing now. Um, and you'll see it, it's it's just a wonderful, wonderful, um, wonderful website. So I'm going to see if I can figure out how to do this. Well, while you're doing that, to anyone who loved the conversation we had with Mike about music and the kind of music he loves, uh, check out 
an album that's one of my all-time favorites, Strike Like Lightning by Lonnie Mack with Stevie Ray Vaughan by his side. Strike Like Lightning by Lonnie Mack and Stevie Ray Vaughan. It's a classic. It was my album of the year way back when. Check it out. It is, it is possibly the album I take to the desert island with me. <laughs> okay, well, hey, um, this was wonderful. We're so thankful that Governor Huckabee was able to come on. Um, him and uh, GK go way back. And um, I actually was looking at one of his books I bought back in 2008 when he was running, Do the Right Thing. You could get that book right now and think he wrote it last month. Um, it is so, ti it's timeless. And uh, because he of the- came awful close to being president. Yeah, because of the common sense approach that he has in life. And, and, and you know, we've talked about this on the show. That's what we need more of. So be sure to visit our website, we have four links there for you to subscribe to Stitcher, to iTunes, to Rumble, to YouTube. YouTube. Also, if you scroll down a little bit right below the microphone, as promised, we just built a Media Minds link. And you can go there, just click on it. It stays, keeps you on the website. And Greg and I have put up um, media sites that we recommend. I still need to add uh, a couple more from, from uh, some of our guests who've been on, and I'll add, I'll add mics there too, um, because we want to help keep you not just entertained, but informed. And then as we get closer to the 2022 elections, we'll probably put up another page called uh, Minor Citizenships or something like that to keep to that. But the sources... You know something, one thing I hope can happen and I, I say this in my prayers. Normally, my prayers relate to my family and the people I love very personal. Uh, but as it relates to our country, I'm very serious when I say this. Uh, we often have major disagreements with people on the other side of the aisle. But America works best when we deal with each other as mature adults. Yeah. We don't hit below the belt. Yeah. And we aim for the heart and the mind and not below the belt. Yep. And it would be very nice if liberals and conservatives, lefties and righties, can start talking to each other rather than at each other. Uh, it goes back to an old um, or recent Christian album, Casting Crowns, and in it, um, the lead singer and the writer says, Mark, his name is Mark Hall, he says, you have to change somebody's heart before you can change their shirt. And so that's what we need to do. we got to win hearts and minds. Well, it's been great. Um, love being able to do this. We'll be sure to get him back on. Um, again, please visit our website, miningthemedia.com. Spread the word, and um, we'll look forward to the next time we meet. Until then, thanks. We're out. <laughs>